It is not easy to talk about astrobiology because it's a new field on one hand and on the other hand it uh, gathers a, a large bunch of very old questions which are dealing with the place of life and mind in the universe in the widest cosmological context. Uh, so there are no official definitions of what astrobiology is except that for instance in one of the founding documents uh, NASA's Astrobiology Roadmap, which has had a dozen or so editions so far, but uh, what is common to all of them is the existence of three so-called canonical questions. Canonical questions are first, how does life begin and evolves in the universe? Uh, second, is there life anywhere beyond uh, the confines of our planet and the third obviously what is the future of life on earth and beyond in the widest astrophysical and cosmological context. Uh, now those questions have been asked from antiquity. The, some of the first philosophers in uh, history of western thought for instance Anaximandros or Empedocles also asked the questions about the origination and evolution of life and whether if we assume that there are many other worlds in today's sense that would correspond to other planets, especially extrasolar planets, uh, whether they are inhabited or not. Uh, the question of uh, whether there, there is life on uh, planets of our solar system, for instance, was uh, very much occupying some of the best minds of uh, uh, especially Renaissance and post-Renaissance culture, like people like Christian Huygens, who in uh, the 1680s uh, wrote the famous Cosmo Theoros, uh, which, is, which was the first debate, the first book, so to speak, explicitly uh, devoted to the issue of uh, scientific or proto-scientific understanding of extraterrestrial life. Of course, it was very fanciful, for instance, Huygens suggested that uh, some of the animals uh, which we know from Earth are so useful, so well adapted, so beneficial to their environment that they must be living on other planets. So he, for instance, implied that there is a hemp growing on Jupiter and that uh, on Mars and on Saturn we can encounter uh, things like uh, hedgehogs, bees and for some strange reason elephants. Uh, so actually this was all very fanciful but he was the first to ask some of the important questions and he was actually the first to suggest that astronomical observations actually he was one of the pioneers of observational astronomy inventing several types of telescopes uh, that uh, astronomy eventually should give us the answer to, to those questions. Uh, later, subsequently in the 19th century with the advent of the theory of biological evolution by Wallace and Darwin, uh, it was uh, first, uh, uh, it was also the question asked uh, from the biological uh, side of the story because there are several very important issues to be determined uh, about the universality of evolution as uh, the founding and the grounding and the most important biological theory, which actually cannot be adequately tested or checked just on Earth. We have a specific instance of life and biosphere and uh, evolution on Earth, but we cannot uh, really perform large-scale experiments, especially in the domain of macroevolution, just on Earth. We need to look elsewhere, we need to search for other habitats and other instances of the origination and subsequent evolution and hopefully complexification of life. On the top of all that, since about 1950s, uh, we have a scientific approach to specific search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, that, that means mind elsewhere, so to speak. So these projects which uh, became known under the famous acronym SETI or Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence uh, have actually started in uh, 1959, 1960 with the publication of one paper by Coconi and Morrison and with the subsequent OSMA project uh, which was undertaken by Frank Drake and others in Green Bank, West Virginia, which was the first systematic search for some artificial radio signals which could be ascribed to our uh, intelligent 
brothers in the universe or some uh, in general other intelligent beings or more precisely intelligent technological civilizations which were supposed to use radio waves as a means of signaling or communication. Uh, now SETI projects have been around for about 60 plus years uh, and so far we haven't got any uh, clear uh, positive signal, although it is not very surprising because the number of targets is so huge and this uh, it is like a proverbial <laughs> needle in a haystack. But how big is the haystack? The haystack is, it turns out, very big because nowadays we know that uh, there are many extrasolar planets, uh, actually there are probably between 50 and 75 billion extrasolar planets in the Milky Way in our galaxy alone. Uh, so that uh, some of them, sizable fraction, on the order of 10%, uh, or maybe 5 to 10%, uh, are located within habitable zones of their parent stars. Uh, that is, they are sufficiently similar to Earth and Earth's position so that we can expect things like uh, liquid water on the surface or the presence of all necessary chemical compounds necessary for uh, early proto-biochemical and biochemical reactions. Uh, so actually this is a huge haystack and uh, we are just big, just began searching uh, that is uh, maybe like um, I don't know, one millionth of a percent of that haystack which has been searched so far. So actually we are on the beginning of, of that great project and in the meantime some very innovative, original, new approaches have been devised which do not depend so strongly on a kind of anthropocentric or, if you wish, geocentric uh, view of especially uh, civilization, technology and cultural evolution, which, which uh, simply do not depend, for instance, on the usage of radio waves, but on some more general properties any intelligent community will have in impacting its immediate physical environment. Uh, since the turn of the century, there have been a growth of uh, organizational network support uh, for astrobiology in, uh, in way of uh, new research journals which has uh, appeared and there are some new institutes uh, which are sometimes based on novel organizational structures like the NASA Astrobiology Institute which is a kind of a very much decentralized uh, a uh, very liberal form of uh, organizing of people of various profiles, various educational and research profiles which are engaged in research which is more or less connected with the main thrust of the astrobiological narrative. Uh, that of, and of course the advent of new generation of astronomical instruments, especially things like uh, Gaia satellite which maps uh, nowadays hundreds of millions of stars in the Milky Way and Kepler uh, orbital observatory which discovered thousands of new planets uh, via transit, uh, by, a, by a method of observing their transit across the disk of their parent stars. And of course a new, a completely new and envisioned or currently beginning operation uh, or instruments like the recently launched uh, James Webb Space Telescope or as it was earlier known, new generation space telescope will enable us unprecedented in-depth view of uh, uh, properties of extrasolar planets, especially that subset of extrasolar planets which are habitable at least in our rather narrow anthropocentric and geocentric viewpoint. Occasionally, when we are talking about astrobiology, uh, people are commenting or, or criticizing or, or have a kind of uh, qualm about uh, uh, discussing extraterrestrial life as it has been already discovered. It is not. Uh, but it is not an argument in itself because after all the boundary between terrestrial and uh, the cosmic domain which was which looked so fixed and firm in the times of, say, Aristotle and subsequent centuries. Uh, nowadays we know that, that there is no sharp boundary between the terrestrial and cosmic domain, so actually the appearance of life on Earth is nothing, nothing special or miraculous. It must be 
uh, an occurrence uh, which is uh, a part of the natural, physical, chemical and ultimately biological evolution of the universe. In addition, there are many examples from the long history of science which actually testify uh, that it is very fruitful and very worthwhile to engage in uh, discussion and uh, research on topics which are not yet strictly confirmed. Uh, for instance, the concept of atoms, as we know, is a thousand years old and uh, it was due to like uh, people of, uh, like Leucippus, Democritus or Epicurus who first coined the very term atom and uh, imposed this atomic hypothesis, which was uh, for 2000 years, it was devoid of any immediate and direct uh, empirical evidence and it was only essentially in 1970s when the discovery of things like a scanning tunneling microscope enabled people for the first time to really see atoms, although in previous decades uh, there, there was a mass of a huge pile of experimental evidence that indeed atoms must exist. Uh, but the science is not about something which necessarily empirically exists, the science is about developing our knowledge of the world which includes many entities which are currently not empirically accessible to us but will be and we have theoretical reasons to believe that they are as we have theoretical reasons to believe that life is indeed truly universal cosmic phenomenon.